Well, good evening, people. Hi, how are you doing? A little, little bit of music playing. I'm waiting for the commercials to get by. See, Sassafras Red is here. So today is the 14th. So tomorrow, obviously, is going to be the 15th. And that's usually whenever I begin. Hi, Mary. That's usually when I begin um, direct sewing. So I am going to be busy, busy, busy for the next week. Fortunately, I have all of next week next week's videos already queued up and scheduled, so I can concentrate on getting seeds in the ground. Of course, I'll bring the camera along with me and and record some of that, I guess. But uh, how's everybody doing out there? Yeah, Sassafras and Mary. I think that's it. Hmm. Mark's here. Mark! Oh, it's Mark. You actually stopped uh, long enough to... <laughs> long enough to watch. Oh, here's everybody. There's Swarmstead and Chris is Clever Craft and everybody else. Wow. So, I, um, I have not been using the vaporizer now for... This is the, the second full day that I haven't used the vaporizer. I didn't use it most of the day, day before yesterday. I just used it in the morning at first and I said, okay, that's it. I'm, I'm going to put this thing down and I'm not going to touch it. I'm, it's time because I've, I've been spending two years slowly reducing the amount of nicotine. Uh, I make my own e-juice. I've been reducing the amount of nicotine in the thing for the past two years to the point where it's, it's just vapor now that I, I'm, I'm sucking on off the thing so it's time to break myself of the habit of using the vaporizer and to help me out with that uh i'm doing a little breathing exercise whenever i get the feeling that i need uh you hit the vaporizer i'll get in there uh, okay chris uh chris says you know i never asked you for advice or to do anything Check out Patriot Homestead's video. Okay. Ooh, okay. I will. I'll do that. Let's see what's going on with the Bartlett pear tree. I mean, I'm not an expert, but I might be able to do some research and help help figure it out. Um. So yeah, doing doing the Qigong exercise, you know, deep breathe, intentional breathing exercise. Whenever I feel the urge to grab the the vaporizer or, you know, if you're trying to quit smoking cold turkey and you're on cigarettes, you can do the same thing. Put the cigarettes away. Whenever you feel the urge to smoke a cigarette, stop and do your intentional breathing exercises. Uh, members, I've got a, a, a basic video explaining how to do those basic breathing exercises in there. <laughs> oh, you're joking. Okay. <laughs> Now, to go along with the other lifestyle changes, uh, I've also kicked off my my new diet, yay, which is pr predominantly nuts uh, for the bulk of the calories, fats, and proteins coming from, from nuts. Uh, but I'm allowed to have up to four cups of tea a day. I quit the coffee. And it's just tea. Can I have four cups of tea a day with a tablespoon of lemon, or not lemon. Why do you keep on saying lemon? A tablespoon of honey. I'll put a tablespoon of honey in here. And they tell me that you can use cinnamon and your and your tea together, and it helps with burning the belly fat. So I'm gonna steal some of the um, some of the cinnamon extract that I've been making. And I'm just gonna put a little spoonful of that cinnamon. Wow, that's potent. That'll take your nose hairs off. All right. So in that you will eat wood video, which is kind of funny. I showed how to how to get this particular particular tincture started, which is just cinnamon bark, you know, the inner bark of a, of, of a tree, cinnamon and rum. And that gets you a cinnamon extract. So the combination of cinnamon and green tea together with honey is supposed to be good for getting rid of that extra, extra belly fat. But we'll see. You know, 64 calories a cup. Hmm. I bet you probably could. 
uh, sassafras red, infuse honey with cinnamon. Um, I don't have a large amount of honey to experiment with at the moment, though, but it, I bet it could be done. <laughs> no. <laughs> One teaspoon of rum <laughs> with the cinnamon in it. It does make for an interesting flavor. Okay, now, the deal is I can have up to four cups of tea a day, up to a pound of in-shell hazelnuts, which is about 120 nuts, give or take. That's 1,200 calories altogether for, for one pound's worth of hazelnuts in the shell. You get more if you buy them shelled, but up to 120 nuts, basically. And then twice a day for lunch and for dinner, I get to have, uh, according to the bees fit into my agricultural plan, I have neighbors that keep bees. <laughs> but eventually I do, I would like to, to, to raise my own. But all right, so this is um, one and a half pounds of dehydrated sweet potato. And just these little, chunks of dehydrated sweet potato so twice a day i have a, a, a soup which is a, a cup of water with a, a tablespoon of chicken broth a quarter pound of, of of sweet potato um of course diced along with uh turmeric root and black pepper a little bit of cumin and uh, also a dash of cinnamon that goes in that as well and that's, I think, maybe 110 calories per, per cup. So that's like 220, 230 calories there. And then uh, 264 from, from the tea. And then up to 1,200 if I eat the full, if I eat a full uh, bag of these in a day. That would be up to 1,200 calories. So hopefully if it works, I'll start burning off some of this, some of this midsection that's going to make breathing a lot easier too. Hmm. Hello, Katie Moyer. Greetings from Southern Illinois, she says. All right. So I was going to talk to you guys a little bit about uh, the names of plants and all that malarkey, right? Because, you know, people like to talk about plants and, and tell you the proper scientific name of plants, but there's a reason behind it. I'll get into that in a minute. Springtime, there's a lot of himbit growing outside. You know what himbit is, right? It's that green plant, little green plant with the square stems, tiny little purple flowers, right? You guys have seen himbit before. Um, about half the time, they're talking about this plant right here. Move that pointer. You guys can see that. About half the time when they're talking about himbit, they're talking about this particular plant right here. All right. But this particular plant is also commonly called henbit. So we have two plants, and they grow side by side, incidentally. I, I think I showed these two particular plants last year on one of my videos and, and sort of talked about the how they're, they're, they're very similar in some respects, but they're actually two different plants. And if you look at them closely, you can tell this one's got those, those triangular-shaped leaves. These ones have more of a... Uh, uh, broken up leaf structure and on this one here the the leaves are clasping the stem all the way around the stem clasping onto the stem and in this one they they come off well you can't really see it but there are there are tiny little stems that connect the leaf to the main stem so a little bit dif different uh habit with the leaves but interestingly enough both of these plants are called him but now, the scientific name for this one is Lamium purpureum, and this one is Lamium amplexical. And purpureum, of course, means purple because it's it has purplish blush on the on the surface of the leaves, and it produces purple flowers. And it's of the genus Lamium. This one is also the genus Lamium, and it's called amplexical because amplexical means clasping. So it's clasping this, the, the, the leaves are clasping the stems, and that's why you get the two different names. They're both edible. They both come up in the springtime. Actually, around here, you'll see them all the way through winter. Um, and they're, you know, they're a member of the mint family, although they don't taste anything at all like mint. But if you're 
in need of something to eat and there is no food and you see this plant growing anywhere just make sure it doesn't have any dog pee on it and you can eat it <laughs> it's it's perfectly safe for you to eat uh, I wanted to show you that we got a couple other couple other examples of, of those two plants paired together you can see that nice purple blush on the on the surface of the leaves of the Lamium purpurium. All right. So what if I was to um, if I was to offer you a, a cup of tea, uh, since I'm drinking tea. Oh, that's another loaded one. There are all different kinds of things that we call tea if we have some sort of a, a plant that we make an infusion out of and put into a cup and drink it's a tea but technically there is only one plant that is properly speaking tea but oh yeah enough of that what if i were to offer you some hemlock tea would would you like a cup of hemlock tea or might that uh might that be a little bit disturbing the the thought the thought that somebody might drink some hemlock tea so it turns out there's another common name there's hemlock, um, which is a a, a wonderful, uh, uh, not, not only medicinal, but good for, for food, uh, not really fantastic for food, um, perennial out there. It's very rich in vitamin C. It's excellent in the winter months to brew up a tea of, of hemlock, mm -hmm. the foliage of the hemlock, and you can eat the inner bark, and that can save your life in an emergency situation. Of course, the hemlock that I'm referring to is called Suga canadensis canadian hemlock or eastern hemlock and it's a member of the panacea family uh so it's a it's a form of pine tree the hemlock that socrates drank that killed him was conium maculatum which is a member of the apatia family and it's more closely related to carrots so just hearing a common <laughs> mark says no thanks hearing the common name for 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 a plant and just referring to a plant by its common name can mean different things to different people. We don't have any of that particular type of hemlock growing near nearby here, although we do have a, a fairly close relative, Queen Anne's lace or wild carrot, which I wouldn't want to consume either. Um, but if I, I just gave you that information that brewing a tea out of hemlock would, would give you a nice infusion of vitamin C and it's good for fighting off colds and stuff like that, but the only hemlock you knew was the poisonous variety, then you might be misled and, and have wrong information. So in order to avoid making grievous errors, it's important to make sure that we specifically identify what plant it is that we're talking about. And that's the reason why people like to use the scientific name, the binomial naming system for plants, just to keep from making horrible mistakes. Now, you run the risk of being mistaken for some kind of elite, elitist snob or a know-it-all by referring to plants by their binomial, but I am trying to get into the habit of doing it because of that, well, that very reason, uh, a mistake could be disastrous. Most of the time, a mistake would be, I recommend a plant and you go and get that particular plant and it turns out that the plant that you got is not the one that I'm talking about and that would be a waste of money. But, um, there's also potential for for more tragic mishaps okay i put some notes up here on the on the the website where i i put down all the things that we're getting ready to talk about and i stole well the stuff that's there on the on the website from uh, ohio state university Binomial snootery. It's yeah. It's 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 not to it's not to be to, not to be a snob or, or or to be a know it all. It's 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 a good habit to get into to learn the binomials because you can make errors and mistakes and sometimes grievous ones if you keep on calling things by their their common name and the person you're talking to doesn't specifically know that that's the plant that you're talking about. Now, when it comes to things like like henbit, if I say henbit. And we're talking about one of these two plants here. Nobody's going to accidentally poison themselves going out and eating henbit. Mm. But obviously, hemlock would be would be bad. Okay.
Katie is saying, oh, talking to Sassfest, we're in the county of South of Carbonell. Where are you finding buckwheat? I'm finding out of stock. Ooh. I got some, but I don't have a lot. Personally, I, I, I've got like four ounces of seed. So I got like a quarter pound of seed. It's enough to plant the ones that I'm going to plant this year. All right. Well, we'll start out with colors. And all right. So uh, I'm not going to try to get the correct pronunciation for the Latin. Hello, Kitty. Uh, because there's there's two different pronouncing. Pronunci uh, obviously, I, I can't pronounce things anyway. But there's two different standards for pronunciation. One is ecclesiastical. That's what, the way the church pronounces things. And then there's there's academic, which is the way scientists pronounce things. And I go back and forth all the time, and I don't know which which uh, convention I'm using from moment to moment anyway. All right. So one of the one of the, the easiest ones to pick up on is the colors. So you learn your colors in Latin, and if you hear the name of a plant and that name pops up, you'll go, oh, that means that particular variety. So we have alba, which is white. You'll see this in things like salix alba, white willow. Uh, salix is the, the genus. All the willow trees are salix genus. All of them contain salicin, which is, of course, the thing that reduces fevers and uh, acts as an analgesic and a blood thinner. There's atter, A-T-E-R, atter, which means black. So you, have, you see that incorporated into a plant name. Oh, no, that, that means there's something about the plant that is black. Aurea is chartreuse, azure, blue. Cirrus is also blue, but a different shade. Chrysis is yellow. Cocinius is scarlet. Ebonus is ebony. You could also use atter, which is black. So there's two different words for black there. Uh, Abernius is ivory. Etheria is red. I guess a different variety of red, but I'm not sure what one they mean by that. Uh, there's ferrogenes, which is rusty. Ferro for iron. So ferrogenes is rusty. Flava is yellow. Gala is milky, which is presumably white, but it might also have something to do with uh, texture or consistency as well. Maybe you've got a a, um, a a blue milky sap. Who knows? <laughs> Hema is blood red. Lacteus is also milky. So several different words that you could use to indicate white, including leuc, L-E-U-C, L-E-U-C, like from leukocytes, white blood cells, white. Lividus, bluish gray. Luridus is pale yellow. Luteus is just yellow. Um, then there's nigra, which is black or dark. Punicius, which is reddish purple, and purpurea, which means purple. Rosia, which is rose, so a rose-colored red. Rubra, which I'm presuming is probably a nice, rich, dark red. Sulfurous, which is yellow. And virens, which is green. So if you see those particular words in a, uh, in a, a Latin binomial, you now know that those are color words. And they're meant to indicate something about the nature of the plant. As a matter of fact, a lot of your, your, your Latin plant names, you can find out quite a bit about the plant if you know what those words mean. All right. Bye, Chris. Chris is going to go take off and watch a movie. Wow. Hmm. What, kitty? What, kitty? All right. Hey, really quick, before I get to the rest of this list, um, one of the things I've been busy doing this week is making some wine. That's right. I'm making red bud wine out of the blooms from a red bud tree. I went out and harvested them a couple of days ago and uh, and put them in a pot and covered them with water, cooked it down, and strained out the, the solid bits of the flowers, and then ran it through one more time and, uh, and boiled that down to get a syrup and I didn't use all red but I also added some some white grape juice and a little bit of peach juice too and I've got that over here um want to see it 
I'm going to show it to you anyway. Hang on a second. Let me, let me unplug the grow lights over here so we can get a look there. All right, so over here, oh, did you see it? The uh, airlock just popped. Oh, I got to trip over this. So I've got, and it popped again. All right, so I've got a six gallon bucket here with about five gallons of of uh, of juice in it. And this airlock up here at the top is just going about once every 10 seconds or so. As the yeast grow inside here, the, they release carbon dioxide. That comes up through this tiny little hole at the top and then it gets trapped inside the airlock until it releases. And it just lets out the carbon dioxide and doesn't let any oxygen in to that uh, bucket. So here in about two weeks or so, in addition to uh, all those pepper plants, I'm gonna have some red bug wine. Turn the lights back on there. Oh, it's too bright in there. It's too bright. All right, let's switch that camera back. There we go. All right, so, yeah, you can actually make wine out of red bud flowers. <laughs> and I'm actually making that to, to get to vinegar. Uh, I want to I wanna make some, some vinegar. And thought it would be kind of cool to make it out of red bud blossoms. Well, it's also going to be a little bit of peach and a little bit of regular grapes. So it'll be a, it'll be a nice tasty wine because Mary likes wine. And then I'll save about a gallon of it just to make vinegar out of. And then I'll have a, a red bud wine vinegar that I can use for putting on salads next year. Mm. Fun stuff. Oh. All right, so let me see here. Other words, other Latin words. Uh, tell us about the origins or maybe where this particular plant grows. For example, alpinus means alpine, clearly, right? But there's another one called Montana, which means not from Montana, but from the mountains. So if you ever see anything that, that has Montana, as, as, as part of its name, for example, Claytonia Montana is a, a Claytonia that grows in the mountains, not specifically in the state of Montana. Uh, Claytonia Montana and Claytonia Sibiricus, oddly enough, are, as far as I can tell, exactly the same plant. And the common name for it is Siberian purslane. Cute little, maybe 12 inch tall, uh, slightly succulent, uh, pink flowered, uh, spring beauty, basically, but it's pink flowered instead of white flowered. And those are edible. I'm, I'm going to try to get some and grow them before too awful long. So speaking of Siberica, that means from Siberia. Um, Amur is from the Amur River. That's in Asia. I don't know what all plants are named that. Canadensis means Canadian. However, there is also... Occidentalis, which means to the West, including North America. But you could have a plant that might have a genus that lives, say, in England, and one that lives in the Americas somewhere. And if those are two separate species of the same genus, the naming convention would put the English version as Occidentalis and the American version, even if it wasn't specifically Canadian, as Canadensis. So basically anything in North America is Canadensis. Then there's Chinensis, which is China, which also is Sinensis, S-I-N-E-N-S-I-S. -E so if you ever see Sinensis, like Camellia Sinensis, the Camellia plant, that comes from China is Camellia sinensis. That's where we get our true tea from. All right. Mm. Great stuff. Japonica is Japan. Maritima is from the seaside. I already mentioned Montana and Occidentalis. But say you want to talk about a plant that's from the east somewhere, but it's not specifically from China. 
or once again, you have that one, one situation where there are two particular plants that are of the same genus, but you, they have some variations and you want to be able to make a distinction between the two. Well, this one's from the east, so we're going to call it Orientalis, but this other one is specifically from, uh, from China, so we're going to call it Sinensis. Then we have Virginia, which means, yeah, it's from Virginia, or possibly just from the east coast of the United States. Sylvesterus means woodland. So if we have Nicotina sylvesterus, one plant that I really want to get my hands on and start growing here in the future, that is a woodland version of the Nicotina, which is the tobacco plant. Incidentally, Nicotina sylvesterus is a night blooming uh, perennial tobacco, which is kind of cool. You just plant it once and then maintain it. It'll keep on growing year after year. Not particularly great for smoking, but it is good for providing a nice, pleasant scent in the evening. And uh, that would have a tendency to draw your mosquitoes away from wherever um, wherever the people are hanging out. Oh, that's I had a lavender flower tucked behind my ear. <laughs> Host said Aquarius is asking, how many new blisters did I get from picking off all those red buds? I didn't get any blisters, but. Um, I, I was I was competing with the um, I was competing with the honeybees because they were out there harvesting nectar, and uh, I, I got up there just in time because they're already starting to form the little the little pea pods. Those are edible too, but once once those pea pods form and the flowers drop off, they get pretty tough pretty quick. So yeah, if you're gonna eat them, you have to eat them about then. And yeah, I mean you can eat the you can eat the flowers too. Let me see. Let me see what's going on out there. Um, all right. Did I miss anything? It doesn't look like I missed anything. Not many people in here tonight. Hi, kitty. Boy. Does anybody want a cat? I got a pest here. Say hello, pest. Say hello, pest. Okay. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, all right. Run. Ah, kitties. All right. So let's see. What are some other words that you see in a plant that tell you something about it? Um, form or habit, the way it grows, the way it looks. Um, for example, um, we have Dutch white clover. Dutch white clover. Trifolium repens. That's the, that's the, 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 the binomial name for Dutch white clover. Tri, T-R-I, I didn't put this in my show notes, but I think you probably already know it. That's Latin for three. Folium, you could probably guess, it's the root word for foliage. That's leaves. So trifolia means three leafed. And repens is a, a cognate of reptans, R E P T A N S, R E P T A N S. Yeah, I can't talk today. Re or repens which means creeping. So we have a three-leaf plant that creeps. Trifolium repens, that's Dutch white clover. All right, but other, other names are contorta, which means twisted. Globosa, which is sort of rounded. Gracilis, which is graceful. And actually, I do have a plant coming in. Uh, it'll start, it'll ship tomorrow, coming from um, a, a nursery up there around Park Hill in uh, Northeast Oklahoma. That's next to Tahlequah, close to Northeastern State University. I found, um, I'll go ahead and tell you guys because you're here now. I found a black willow. Uh, I mean, a black pussy willow, not not just black willow, but it's, it's a pussy willow. But instead of having pink catkins, it's got black ones. They're kind of purplish black. <laughs> it's pretty cool. And the and the the the, uh, the binomial for it includes uh, gracilis and uh, acer. So it is a graceful 
black salix. Just, just kind of cool. All right. Anyway, so then we have uh, makalata, which means spotted. Magnus is large. Nana is dwarf. Pendula usually means weeping. Prostrata is another word for creeping. And although it's not on the list, um, the word umbra or umbral means umbrella shaped. So, for example, if I have an Ilex vomitaria umbelletta, hang on a second, that's three names. So let me tell you about three names since, they're not, since we're now into trinomials. Okay, so we have a genus and a species name. That's great. Every single Ilex vomitoria, Ilex, of course, are hollies. Vomitoria means the one that makes you throw up. So we're talking about Yopon holly. And it was given that unfortunate name of vomitoria because uh, the naturalists that, that first recorded it learned about it from studying the habits of the, uh, the Eastern tribes folk of, of North America. Uh, who would use this particular plant for a variety of reasons, including a, a ceremonial use, which involved imbibing a large amount, which would be sufficient to cause you to lose your lunch. But apparently, once you have that high of a dose of this plant in your system, you can talk to God, presumably. I wouldn't recommend it. Mm. But that would be uh, drinking a tea of the berries, not of the leaves. If you drink a, a tea out of the leaves, then you're going to be uh, taking in some caffeine, much like, well, Camellia sinensis or coffee. Hi, Kitty. Yes, you can get your claws out of my legs. Thank you. All right. But there are different subspecies of Alex vomitoria. There's, of course, the standard one, uh, Virginia, which is the one that grows on the East Coast, right? And there's also one called Pendula, or Weeping, and Nana. And Pendula and Nana versions of Alex vomitoria are often seen in landscaping nurseries because they're a very popular landscaping plant. Just turns out you can harvest leaves from this popular landscaping plant and brew a tea out of it and get your dose of caffeine if you're hard up. Mm. So whenever you've already got the established genus and species of a plant, but you discover a new variant of that instead of coming out with a whole new binomial for this one variant which is otherwise genetically identical to all the other members of the species you add a a cultivar or, or variant name which is basically the third name and that's why you occasionally you'll have you know genus species and then in parentheses whatever the the variant name is that's been tap, tacked onto it and usually that one Specifically, is going to have a color word or uh, or a, a form or habit word involved with that name to let you know what it is. All right, so Joe Serrano came in. Oh, I see Stone Ape came in, and John came in, and let's see. Sass Press Red was giving a location of where to get some buckwheat. That's cool. Is that perennial buckwheat, the, the, the pink flowered stuff that you're getting? Mm. Because the, the stuff that I have is it's, it's, it's got those pink flowers. So it's um it's proper soba, soba buckwheat. All right. Joe says, hello from Mexico, better late than ever. Yeah. John got here. John, uh, John is up there close to where Sooner Plant Farm is, where I'm getting that uh, that willow tree, and he's got himself some oak trees started. He started them up from acorns. So if anybody is looking for some acorns or looking for some oak trees, John's got some. Uh, John, do you, do you do you happen to know specifically which type of oak those are? If you do. Drop it in the chat so people will know what kind of oak trees you've got. Let's see. Da, da, da. John said, did I hear him write a black bull? Yes, it's it, a black pussy bull. Kind of cool. 
<laughs> Sass Press Red says, I have drank that much coffee to talk to God. <laughs> hmm. Free Henley Made from Montana is here. Hello. Hi, hi, hi. Everybody say hello to everybody. Oh, okay. So Sass Press brought it just to, bought it just to sprout it. So you're, you're growing it for microgreens or sprouts. I mean, they're pretty good for that. Good, good food source. I grow, uh, I grow amaranth to, to sprout for for greens. Uh, Joe, pussy willows are shrubs. From what you just mentioned, they're tree. Yeah, they're 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 a very very short tree, very short, and usually, well, usually they have the habit of growing up from the from the root ball at, at the bottom. So they'll if you cut them back, they'll put up several different um several different stems stalks trunks they grow like a shrub but you know, they are technically a tree and uh pussy willows are going to be about 12 foot tall so they're really great if you're going to be putting them in the understory if you're going to have some larger stuff over the top of it they aren't going to get all that tall so this one is fairly close to the trunk of the the pecan it's about 20 feet away from the pecan so it will have no problem at that, at that particular location. Um, they don't mind a little bit of shade and it'll get, it'll still get some sunshine. Okay. So John is saying he believes that those are red oak. I don't want any red oak. I'm an oak snob, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you can, you can grow some red oak and cut, cut, cut them up and get some shiitake logs out of those. and. I think I was talking to, uh, who was it? Um, Carl's off grid up there in, uh, in Wisconsin. He has quite a few, quite a few trees on his, on his little, uh, his little getaway acreage and, uh, was pondering things to do with them. And, you know, you can always, if you have a lot of wood, uh, you can cut out some logs that are maybe, you know, two feet long or so, you know, nice manageable size, two feet by about, meh four to six inches in diameter and then spend some time with your drill popping holes in it pack some shiitake mushroom spawn into it plug the plug the plug that up with beeswax and you can take those into the city and sell them to the city slickers all day long because who wouldn't like to have their very own shiitake producing log in their own uh their own backyard or stuff stuffed away in their closet somewhere right you're in the middle of the city you're growing your own mushrooms you Take care of all the all that work for them, and uh, they'll 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 pay for the log. You don't even have to harvest the mushrooms. Okay, Joe says buckwheat. I uh, bought buckwheat. I bought to eat are the seed processed like oats into oatmeal. Got to check where to buy. Uh, okay. Cool, cool. Uh, oh yeah, I, I forgot. Yeah, you, you you can get it from Outside Pride. I don't know if Outside Pride has the perennial or not. I was really interested in getting perennial buckwheat. Because it's perennial. <laughs> Lori's world says hi over here. Gail lurking. Hello, all my friends. Oh, is Gail lurking too? She probably is. All right. Oh, Sassafras Red, Sass Red said Vermont Willow has an incredible selection of. Oh, okay, that, that's the the company is Vermont Willow, all kinds of flower cuttings. Oh, ooh. I just thought the black was really kind of cool. It's like I've never seen a black willow tree. <laughs> I've seen the I've seen the the little pink ones, and those are cute. It's like hmm, but yeah, if you copy them, the, then they'll just stay short, and they'll keep on producing large amounts of uh, of wood for you. And that's great because you know you can use willow wood for all different kinds of things. You use the bark, of course, as a as a fever reducer, analgesic, uh, uh, blood thinner. Uh, soak it up in, into your water that you're going to to uh, put your cuttings in while you're waiting to to get them rooted. It gives them a better chance of getting rooted because it actually does have a hormone in that that helps with rooting. Um, the the wood once you've removed that bark is excellent for making charcoal for medicinal purposes uh, or well, any other purpose, really.
All right. Let me see here. Okay, so John says his boss is calling it a burr oak. All right. Really large, really large acorns on, on burr oaks. That's, that'd be one way you can tell. Kind of large and, and it's you know, a long, a long acorn, but large. Probably you know, anywhere from about thumb size to... Uh, part of my finger there pretty big size acorn and it doesn't take many of them to to make a meal burr oaks are good uh, I, I i've got one growing uh the groundhog took a took a pass at it and took the first set of leaves off but uh, uh hopefully it won't <laughs> come back for another round it topped one of my pecan trees too <clears throat> i don't like that groundhog I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna resort to dynamite before too long, I think. Um, so let's see. Rickshaw project is going on vacation. Overcup oak, big nut with a very big cap almost covering the acorn. That uh, really large nut, large cap almost covering the entire acorn sounds like uh, like one of the white oaks. Pooping its oh, oh my goodness, maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> oh my goodness. Hey, I'm out of tea. My tea didn't last the full hour. That was pretty good. Yeah, it might. Oh, okay. So, uh, so Stone Date Farm, you're saying that that um, putting some urine down into the uh, into the burrow might. Uh, Encourage the uh, the whistle pig to to pack up and move off. Yeah, but at, th at this time, at this point, I'm I'm willing to try just about anything, up to and including dynamite. <laughs> I get your point. Yeah, I, I would move if a giant pooped in my house too. <laughs> Doggy poo. All right. Let me see. There's some some common root words that wind up going into into the binomials for plants as well. Uh, anytime you see the word anthos, that means flower. So you might see these in combination. So you might have something genus. Um, Azuranthus, which would mean whatever genus of plant that is with blue flowers. Brevi usually means short, hence, you know, abbreviated. That's where that came from. Philly is thread like, as in filamentous. Um, I actually have a a filamentosa version of a hosta coming in sometime within the next couple of weeks. Uh, really cool plant. Uh, if you don't know, hostas are, are, are also edibles. Yes, they're they're ornamental plants, but they're edible too. And they're really great for shade gardens. And I've got a spot on the north side of the house where there's a little corner. And that corner, Mary thinks that it gets morning sun. Actually, it doesn't. <laughs> it never gets sun. Well, okay. In the winter, I think. So I think it's in the winter. Occasionally, it almost gets sunshine in the winter, but or maybe it's in the summer. I have to double check. It doesn't get very much sun sunlight at all, and only in the very early morning. And then by the time the sun gets 
up to about nine o'clock in the morning that it's gone. It'll be in shade for the rest of the day. So I've got this little corner that's, that's almost always shaded. And I'm putting a few plants in there. One of them is a, a filamentous pasta. It has white leaves. The leaves are white. And just little tiny threads shot through those white leaves have a little bit of chlorophyll chlorophyll in them. And that's the only pigmentation it has is the chlorophyll that's in those little filaments running through the leaves. Real cool looking plant. Okay, anyway, enough of that. Flora, of course, flowers, folius, foliage, leaves. Grandi, large. Hetero, meaning diverse. Um, Levis means smooth. Lepto means slender. Macro means large, kind of like Magnus. Magnus and macro both mean large. Media means intermediate. Mega, big, micro, small. Mono means there's just one, and multi means many. So, for example, I've got a tree growing out there, which is a member of the Eliagnus genus. Eliagnus is from uh, Eli is from Olea or olive. Agnus meaning pure. And then the particular species that I'm growing out there, it's not on a olive. It is Gumi is the common name, but this the binomial is multiflora, so many flowered, indicating that it produces a whole bunch of flowers and produces a whole bunch of fruit. And unlike the the autumn olive. Uh, the Eliagnus multiflora doesn't send off runners everywhere and just take over whatever space you planted in. So I have all the advantages of the autumn olive and without the disadvantage of having uh, a plant that tries to take over and rule the world. I've got enough plants that want to rule the world as it is. <laughs> Let me see here. Mounted C4. Okay, so Arkansas has got a Mark's got a got a solution for uh, for the groundhog. Acorns are about the size of a 20 ounce bottle top and or bigger. All right, Joe says blueberries require six soil to grow. Uh, I do know they can grow in alkaline soil if we put aluminum sulfate on them. And, and the real well, yeah. If you if you've got anything with that supplies sulfur to your to your soil, um, your microorganisms, the the geobacter uh, bacteria will consume that, and they'll produce sulfuric acid as a byproduct, which is what makes the the soil close around the roots of that plant more acidic, and that helps the blueberry get the nutrients that it specifically requires, which is a little bit different nutrient profile from some other plants that are growing nearby. Um, there are other ways that you can you can help out your, your blueberry plants as well. Now the soil that I'm growing in, the native soil, is anywhere from a 7 to a 7.5, which is slightly alkaline. Uh, but with the with the mycorrhizal inoculant that I'm giving those blueberries, they should should be okay. Uh, if they wind up showing signs of, of, of not being able to, to get enough nutrients, I can always feed them some extra, uh, extra sulfur. All right, Joe's saying yesterday, okay, continue, continue that about, about, about bloopers. He's saying all you need to do is mulch them with pine needles. Is this right? Uh, I mean, you can. You can get a little bit of acidity from pine needles. Better for uh, better for acidity, though. Instead of using pine needles, use uh, use the the cones from um, alder trees. The, the the little seed cones off of alder trees are are are, are good for increasing uh, acidity or lowering pH. Um, but really, as long as you've got 7.5 and lower pH in your soil, I wouldn't worry about it too much. If you're if you got really alkaline soil, like you know, an eight or so, then you might need to do something to, to lower your pH. Otherwise, they're in the right range for them to take up nutrients from just about everything they need to take up nutrients from. 
All right. Yeah, you can use rat bait for your groundhog problems. Yeah, yeah, and you can also wind up with with you know a uh, problem from that other animals getting poisoned by the rat bait. Um, I could put it down the hole. And I hope that the groundhog eats it. But if a rat eats it, and the rat gets out and um, either marries dog or my outside cat decides to have a snack on the on the poisoned rat, will it will it adversely affect the uh, the other animal? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's fresh rabbit saying the same thing. Comes out of the hole and is eaten by a scavenger or eaten by not a scavenger. Uh, well, yeah, by a scavenger or uh, or by a predator. Um, we have a lot of hawks out right now, and owls not far away either. Not that the owls going to come and get a groundhog because groundhogs are diurnal and the owls are nocturnal. But you know what I mean. Um, let's see. Cover the hole. Mark is saying, I added a cup of sulfur around my plants with rabbit manure and covered it with, with leaf rake. Uh, covered it with leaves, raked it in. Nice. All right. So check your check your soil pH, and if it's and if it's you know seven point five and lower, you might not need to do anything to adjust your soil. All right. Yeah. Red says hawks and eagles are showing up are showing levels of rat poisoning. Just saying, yeah, that's one of the problems with using poisons, the, the downstream effect on everything else and kind of want the hawks and the eagles and the owls to, to take care of most of the rodents for us. It's just occasionally we get too many. Could always encourage more snakes, I suppose, but I don't particularly want to encourage a lot of snakes. All right, what are some other words? Uh, Multiphylos means leaf or foliage. Platy means flat or broad, and poly means many. Okay, not a complete list. Um, so you're going to have some other plants out there that uh, you can look up the Latin for it if you if you feel inclined, especially if you keep on seeing it showing up all over the place, right? Uh, for example, your Chinese yam or cinnamon vine is Dioscoria polystachia. Um, which is a weird name. We know that Dioscoria, that's all the yams. All the, the genus Dioscoria is all, all of the yams. Poly, we now know that means many. And Statia, I looked this up, it's Latin, it means ear. So the Chinese yam is the many-eared yam, although I think Dioscoria sinensis would be a better name for it. And sometimes you'll, you'll have that happen. You'll have, um, you have a plant that's given... A, a binomial by one person in one part of the world, and uh, another person in another part of the world will name the exact same plant, but give it a different binomial. <laughs> and uh, there was there was an incident where uh, pepper, that's fairly common and, and popular pepper, got named uh, Capsicum chinensis, or chin chinens. With the ch, not sinensis, but the, the, they named it with the with the ch. Chinensis, Chine, yeah. Um, and the guy that named it, I've heard two different stories about why he named it this way. One story goes, he was trying to market the pepper, and he figured that if he gave it a name that indicated that it was from China, it would make it mysterious and and exotic, and people would want to buy it. And the other version is a little bit more more mundane. He found it in a market in in the Orient and thought that that's where it came from. Well, it turns out that this particular pepper, which, uh, uh, as you might already have guessed, the habanero pepper, uh, didn't come from the Orient at all. It actually came from uh, Central America and South America, and it was being cultivated there for thousands of years, like at least 7,000 years in the past. They were cultivating this pepper. The common name habanero actually came from Havana, Havana, H A B A N, Havana. So it's the it's the Havana pepper. 
although the people in Cuba, as far as I know, don't eat it because it's too hot. <laughs> but that's um, a little funny story about things getting misnamed. Let's see. Would oak leaves add, add acidity to the soil? Mm. Yeah. Well, basically, any sort of any sort of uh, tree leaf is going to push the soil uh, slightly down in pH as it as it decomposes. Humic acid it does lower pH. Um, most of the time, you don't have to do a whole lot to 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 adjust your pH. Well, I don't know why I'm looking at my teacup. There's nothing in it. You don't have to do anything to adjust your pH unless it's already out of balance. John says the coyotes are really bad. Most of the cat. Yeah, I've been seeing a lot of people up that way, uh, going on coyote hunts and just getting yote after yote. All right, Sasper's Red says we found a wild blueberry patch in a mixed oak and pine forest in eastern Missouri. Yeah, you'll you'll find often you'll find um, an association with pines and ericaceous plants, possibly because of pH issues, but also possibly because pines form mycorrhizal associations with an ectomycorrhizal fungus. And there's another plant that's in the understory that also has an association with the pine, but also with the blueberry. And so you've got something bridging between, between pines and blueberries, possibly. All right, Joe's saying, that's it, Joe's saying, Letting check it away from me. Balance is the key, and we keep fighting balance and creating balance. Yeah, yeah. Whenever you're doing, whenever you try to correct something, make very, very small adjustments. Make a small adjustment and then wait and see what happens. Make a small adjustment, wait and see what happens. Small adjustments. That way, you don't create too big of an imbalance and then have to go fix your error later on. That was a talk a couple of months ago. <laughs> All right, Joe says, there are oak trees to the south of here, so maybe they can thrive. I wonder, there's probably some variation of blueberry that can grow that far south, right? Uh, okay, Joe, no, not jalapeno, habanero. The habanero pepper was named after Habana. <laughs> of course, if you're speaking Spanish, it's Havana. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. That's the, the, yeah. They didn't like it. I mean, but it that does grow in that region. It was grown there a long, long time ago. I mean, a long, long time ago. At least 7,000 years ago, they were growing that pepper. So that would have been, what, Olmex, maybe? Olmex and Mayans? Well, Mayans are probably more recent. But right around your part of the world is where the where the habanero originally came from. All right. Katie says, I got a fire ring, got a little campfire over the tunnels. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, this groundhog has tunneled under the carport and under a shed. <laughs> so I can't build a fire over it. Unfortunately, I'd love to. John said, here, it's groundhog eats my plants. Coyotes eat the groundhogs. Yeah, we don't have that many coyotes here. I'm too close to the city. I mean, you could occasionally spot a coyote or a fox, but they're not as common. <laughs> I 
<laughs> it's all right, Joe. <laughs> Yeah, if you use Spanish pronunciation for habanero, it's habanero. It's from Havana. But they don't eat them there. All right. Mark is saying, I'll get some wintergreen and test it out. Have a huge pine. Oh, yeah. What is the GS of the wintergreen? What is the GS? What are the... Not sure what you're, what you're talking about when you say GS, G slash S. What is the. All right. Well, I'll just talk about wintergreen bridging in, in general then. Okay. So uh, if you recall from a couple of weeks, maybe a month or two ago, I was talking about mycorrhizal associations, ran down the list of plants and what associations they form. Uh, all the, the, the ericaceous plants, blueberries and cranberries and things of that nature, have a specific set of mycorrhizal fungi that they associate with. But there are some plants that are capable of forming associations with both ericaceous mycorrhizae and ectomycorrhizae, and wintergreen is one of those. Wintergreen is one, heather is one of them, uh, and then the other ones are all poisonous, and so there's like mountain ash and stuff like that. You probably don't want to grow that, unless you've got a specific medicinal reason for growing it. I mean, it's toxic. You don't want to have kids accidentally eating it. I don't mind having some yopon holly out there in the front yard. If somebody happens to eat a berry or two and realize, oh yeah, these aren't all that good and they toss their cookies and see God. Well, that's 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 their lesson because you can eat every, the fruit of every tree in my garden except for that one. <laughs> um, all right, so the ones that are capable of forming the, the mycorrhizal associations with both ectomycorrhiza and ericaceous mycorrhiza have the potential to form a bridge between between two different trees. If you've got your ectomycorrhizal associated trees in the overstory, the, the big trees, and they're capturing most of the sunlight and doing most of the photosynthesis, whenever they feed carbon into the, the mycorrhizal network, that's now available for things like the wintergreen down here. And the wintergreen can also form that association with your blueberries. So your blueberries can grow in the shade of your fir trees or your pine trees, and the wintergreen serves as a as a bridge between the two of them. And there are probably other plants out there that are growing wild that we haven't really studied enough to know that they're forming that kind of an association as well. Because this is, <laughs> I mean, I think 95, 1995 was whenever whenever it was first discovered that this network even existed. And uh, so it's 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 all fairly recent new stuff. Let me see here. Sasper says, "Honey, the coyotes is better than poison or trapping. More fun too." <laughs> Joe is asking, "What's the hottest habanero or ghost pepper?" Uh, I've never tried a ghost pepper. Habanero is hot enough for me, by golly. I like to take it and uh, I could take one habanero pepper and one pineapple and blend the fruit of the pineapple up and toss the one habanero pepper in there without the stem, of course. A couple drops of olive oil as an emulsifier and make a, a dipping sauce that you keep nice and chilled. And then you go and you get your shrimp, your camarones. Get your camarones and you devein them and, and shell them and you leave the, the tails on. And so you, now you've got them butterfly with the tails on and Dip them in a little bit of egg wash, a little bit of flour on the outside, egg wash again, and then coat them with coconut. And you deep fry those until the coconut turns nice and golden brown, and you take them out and you serve them up with a dish of that sauce that you've made out of one pineapple and one habanero pepper. And you dip that in there and you take a bite, and all different kinds of wonderful things start happening. First off, the sauce has been chilled, so it's cold. And it contrasts with the fresh, piping hot, freshly fried coconut shrimp, which is hot. <laughs> so you have cold and hot together, which is nice. And then the next thing you notice is it's sweet and it blends well with the coconut and the shrimp. And that's all. It's a wonderful, sweet flavor. It's very, very nice. And you're chewing that. And then a second later, you realize, oh, but it's hot. <laughs> Picosa, not, not caliente. Until you're eating this coconut shrimp until you've eaten the entire serving of it, and then you order more, and this is the way you can have your restaurant make billions of dollars. 
<laughs> I created that that dipping sauce. Um, geez, about thirty years ago, and I've seen a couple places adopt it now, which is kind of cool. Let me see here. I am just. Come on, homesteading down there in Florida. Says can't stay long. Got to jump in and say come and say hey, buddy. Come on. Ah, well, thanks for stopping by. And Mark is saying Olmec is 10 to 12,000 plus years, and Mayan's only four to seven. Okay, so, uh, the like the dawn of Mayan civilization would be whenever they were they're cultivating the habanero pepper were they paving everything yet by then by then do you think i wonder about that like they're going along and it's you know it's all jungle now but they would go along and they they, they dig out the limestone they cut down some trees they they'd roast the limestone with the with, with the wood from the trees and they'd make cement and they would pave everything i mean they had massive cities just simply massive, and now it's all jungle. And I'm not kidding, massive cities, massive, bigger than the city I live in, and it's only got a population of close to close to a half a million. All right, Katie is saying our groundhogs were under boathouse and cabin. Ah, lovely. Air quality is not negotiable. I imagine. Melody from Baker Lake and Let's Dig at Homestead says hello, Jason Neighbors. Hi, Melody. All right. So Joe says, I learned from a Jamaican chef here that coyotes or alligator pears in the south are called conchos in Jamaica. Uh-huh. My nomenclature for the wintergreen is Galtheria, G-A-U-L, Theria, Galtheria procumbens. Procumbens, which is also another creeping descriptive word. Hence, creeping wintergreen. And Galtheria might indicate Gaul. Uh, where is that? France originally, I think. All right. Tennessee Wholesale Nursery has wearing a green. I saw that. I did. And I thought about ordering some. I'm, I'm still thinking about it. I mean, it's tempting. It, 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 it is tempting. I might, I might, I still might go ahead and pull the trigger and, and go ahead and, and order a hundred. Spend 79 bucks, get a hundred plants. I mean, they're, 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 they're just little tiny plug starts is what they are. They're, you know, out of the 72 cell tray, they've got a plug start. But hey, I'm gonna drop two or three plug starts down in between my in between my my trees, and then put the rest of them up for sale on the website. I still might do that. I don't know. I haven't decided yet. I've been doing a lot of checking up on uh, Tennessee Wholesale Nursery, trying to make sure that the the reviews are good. And they, they've got good reviews. They got bad reviews. I think uh, the only problem that people have with them is. They ship bare root plants, <laughs> and people have the idea in their head that if tree must come in a pot, otherwise there's something wrong with it. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. Uh, but I do have Tennessee Wholesale Nursery saved to my favorites, so I'm kind of I'm still investigating them. Hello, Tim at Ridge Life. Late as always. Hmm. Let's see what's going on out there. Now, Mel, did you go to uh, to Tim's Watch and Grow? Is the live session that he has on Tuesday nights? You can go to. You should really go go to go to Rich Life on Tuesday night, seven p.m. Central Standard Time, unless he's changed the time. Um, and get in there an hour or two ahead of time, and just drop in the chat your channel name, how many subscribers you currently have, say hi to everybody, and uh, 
every every Tuesday, Tim will will go and uh, sit down with a whole bunch of us, and we'll sit down together and we'll watch people's YouTube channels, which is kind of fun. So just hanging out with friends, watching some YouTube. It's so YouTube and chill. John says Ghost Pepper is the hottest, and Robert wants to know if the uh, cookie tossing event involved Boone's Farm or tequila. It might have involved mushrooms. You never know. Mm, or cactus fruit. Oh yeah, yeah. Tim's got some uh, some recent experience with uh, some hot peppers. <laughs> You really got to stop eating crazy stuff whenever people send, send stuff to you. A bug trying to crawl over my camera there. Hey, there's Carl's off the grid. Just spotted him. And while I was scrolling down, I, I, I missed, missed some stuff. Involved little blue meanies with funny little caps. Oh, okay. Okay, so yeah, we're talking about... Okay, so, so Taz Brass Red's encounter involved smurfs i was thinking about doing an entire an entire thing about uh, <clears throat> about that uh fairy lore fairy lore yeah the mushroom people just like detroit okay Yeah, uh, so Joe's talking about the, the the cities in 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 Mexico, particularly that escape detection because of uh, jungle over, overgrowth, and then further south, being at such a high altitude that you wind up being out of breath before you ever got up there. Not that you could even get up there on the little tiny goat track that you have to go up to to get to some of those places, which makes you wonder. The rocks were quarried hundreds of miles away and hauled by hand up a path this wide. Yeah, no. <laughs> I don't know how they built some of these places. But, uh, so, uh, yeah, even at that time, some of those cities were, were already, they had already um, been consumed by the jungle by the time the, the Spanish got there. I've got a crazy out there theory that uh, that the cradle of civilization wasn't wasn't in the Middle East at all. I think it was in South America <laughs> because simply because of the, the the point in time whenever some of these things would have had to have been built, you, you couldn't build them there now. You'd run out of breath before you got the block halfway up the mountain. But uh, far enough in the distant past, whenever the atmosphere is thicker, then you might have been able to do the work up there on those mountaintops. Stone Date Farmer says, the largest Aztec pyramid was contemporary with the painting of the Sistine Chapel. Hmm. All right. Well, yeah, we're, we're assuming the Aztecs are, are, are the, most, the most recent of the, the, the large structure building civilizations that were in in uh, uh, in Mexico but um, I always had questions about that 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 presumed timeline so during the ice age people are supposed to walk across the Bering Strait Mi started migrating down through 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 the Americas first through North America down through down through South America remember they're doing this on foot and they had to get through Panama too on foot. And so eventually they wind up. This is this is where people are now rolling on the floor laughing because they realize how hard it would be to actually walk through Panama on foot. <laughs> they get all the way down there into South America and then they climb up to the tallest mountains that they can find and begin building without practicing first these monumental structures with su this superb engineering skill and stone cutting ability without ever having once practiced. <laughs> And then they abandon them immediately. And by the time the Spanish arrive, 
uh, the people that are living in those this those areas go, yeah, we don't know who built those. <laughs> Something's wrong with the timeline. <laughs> Sasps Fred says, I've seen Elvis in northern New Mexico. He is making tea and handing out. Yeah. <laughs> right. Cat without the hat's been listening in. Hello, cat without the hat. Being sneaky. Okay, so uh, I think you're talking about uh, Tennessee nursery. Sass Fred says, I only know I wrote a river came from them, showed up dead and without, oh, without roots. Get the wintergreen. Get the wintergreen. You can use it. You know, plant it around next to your uh, next to your filberts, and then you can then you can plant some blueberries. All right. Oh my goodness, <laughs> Joe! <laughs> in the old days, besides spicing up the food, chilies were burned in a room. The disobedient child was shut in there. You can be well sure that he or she behaved. Yikes! Those uh, are here. All right. Okay. Do we have audio? Just checking real quick. Do we still have audio? It looks like we still have audio. Okay. So I just glitched for a minute there. I don't know why. After we've been on for an hour, it starts glitching. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, as take as hardcore folks. <laughs> also, maybe he's forgetting elephant and ghost pepper, and he's running for water. Sea levels are lower than migrated before the last catastrophic event. Now, I think probably people have been going back and forth across the strait for a while. So, you know, you're going to have relatives on either side. All right. Maya's older than the Aztecs. Trade was from the North, South America, the Rockies, Mississippi Valley works the archaic okay, within time periods. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of world trade going on a long time ago. You know, there's copper that was mined out of mines around the Great Lakes that's been found all over the world. It's just we don't have any recorded history from those time periods. You know, maybe whoever was was living at that time at that at that time uh, kept their their records in in digital form or wrote it down on paper, and you know, digital form and paper doesn't last. You got to bake it in clay or carve it in stone. Otherwise, we don't know about it. Sasper says, my loud friends would roast the chili, roast high chilies on a walk. Oh, those are good chilies, too. Very, very hot. Very, very hot. No, kill your taste buds, but they're, they're very hot. <laughs> All right, so mountain builders, your state as well as Southern Illinois. Probably what the Spanish thought were the seven golden seas of, uh, of Cibola. It Well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking that the people in South America knew about the cities to the north and had been out of contact with them for so long, they were legendary by that time. But the footprint for, uh, for Monk's Mound in Illinois is is much bigger than the the Great Pyramid at Giza, and it's it's big. Calling it a mound is um is kind of an insult. I mean, it would be kind of like calling the pyramids piles of rock. <clears throat> All right, 
can you imagine the mound builders during a fully flooded river system in canoe, canoe hunters paradise? Hmm. Anyway, hey, we've been here for an uh, hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> they call Southern Illinois Little Egypt. So we've been going here for about one hour and 20 minutes or so. I uh, just want to thank everybody for showing up tonight. I hope you learned a little bit of something about why we use these Latin words to refer to our plants. Right. To tell one plant from the other, especially if they have the same common name, we don't get confused. And also, you know, what some of those words mean. Joe's saying that the mound is actually an overgrown pyramid. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, take a look at the mounds in Mexico. You know, before they were excavated, they were mounds, a pile of dirt, artificial hill. And then they removed all of that stuff and discovered, oh, there's a pyramid under here. <laughs> but they aren't doing that in in uh, in in north america because it's become illegal to do excavation of the mounds of the mounds and some of them are burial mounds not, not be mistaken about that some of them actually are burial mounds and they do have remains in them and others are they're not not at all <laughs> anyway thanks for stopping by guys I am going to go ahead and uh, call it a night. Let's see. Con the chat's still going. <laughs> I don't want to stop you while you're still ha still having your conversation. But I'm I'm going to call it a night. Uh, go ahead and make up some some soup with some sweet potato in it and uh, and turn in because I'm going to have a busy day planting tomorrow. It is that time. Uh, you guys know what to do. I'll catch you next time.